The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International. So good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, wherever you are at this moment in the world today. We're broadcasting from the Nomadic Institute for Cultural Activism International at the Indian Road Cafe in Inwood, New York. And we're very excited to be here. The restaurant is like a living artwork created and curated by its proprietor, Tom Bosco here. And Tom, thank you and thank your staff for hosting the broadcast and welcoming the audience who are here, some of them in attendance at the cafe under strict COVID safe protocols. Emily Harris, our hosting producer and I are maintaining social distance and an open door allowing for ventilation from other aspects of the restaurant. And Tom is gonna to say a little welcoming note for us. And we really appreciate being here with you, Tom. Thank you. Sure, my name is Tom Bosco. I'm the owner of the Indian Royal Cafe. I wanna welcome all, all you people to the, to, the, to the cafe. And I wanna thank John and Emily for, uh, for asking me to, to help host this here today. Uh, I've been uh, the owner of the cafe for a year and a half. And one of the main reasons why I got into this business, I used to be in advertising, uh, is that um, it checked a lot of boxes, particularly uh, boxes related to community to community service. Right. The cafe itself is an extension of the community, as you guys know that if you live around here. Uh, and more important than just an extension of the community, but it, it's an opportunity to extend voices of the community and causes of the community. Uh, it's something that we're very passionate about here from things we put up on our wall to events that we hold in the park. Um, we're cause related and we think that we have uh, a responsibility to the community as we play an intricate role in it. It's certainly what got me involved here. You're a, so <laughs> you're, you're a socially engaged uh, entrepreneur. I am, yeah, certainly, yeah, definitely. And you mentioned earlier today that you want to perhaps bring some of our common roots from Italy. Perhaps oh, I would love that, yeah. Culinary culture yeah. In, into the space yeah. here. Yeah, we're actually renaming the, the cafe, the, uh, the, uh, the Inwood Farm. Inwood Farm. Because this used to be all farmland. Okay. And we like it to be influenced from certain cultures, one of which is uh, an Italian culture. So, Thanks. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the show. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll yeah. see you later. Yeah, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so here we are. And thanks again to Tom and the staff and um, our, our co-host, Emily Harris, um, uh, and we're here with Chuya, Chia. Um, thanks, Chuya. Um, can you hear us well enough? Uh, yeah, at the moment. Uh, the audio sometimes a little bit on and off, but um, at the moment is working good. Okay, we'll um, just do our best with the sound. I think if I speak up, perhaps that'll be more helpful because Perhaps sometimes the audio will rise if I don't say anything, and then you hear the background. So I'm going to mute myself from time to time so you guys don't have any interference while, you, while you're speaking, Chu Yi. I want to welcome our, our friends from different parts of the world, and um, thank you, European friends, for joining us at this late hour in your day. Um, tell us a little bit, Chu Yi, uh, right now, what is the weather like and what's the daylight situation? Is it very dark? Uh, give us a little bit of local, um, you know, sort of uh, background context where you are. Yeah, um, it's now it's February, so it's moving towards equinox time. It's about 10 hours sunlight. And uh, we had quite a lot of snow this year uh, the, in the whole the, um, February. So um, it just melted away. So we had been like under minus for a very, very cold uh, February so far. And um, it just get a little bit warmer now. Um, little sun and today a little bit fog, beautiful. And uh, you start seeing like a snow drop coming. And so, yeah something like that. So snow are uh, all melted away here in the uh, west side of Sweden.
you are muted, uh, John. Okay, this is the, I think the third time we took our show on the road and um, first time with background noise. So we have to, I have to discipline myself to remember, mindful, mindful. Uh, Don't I was worry, saying, I can remind you. <laughs> yeah, good. You can just go like whatever you want to do. Yeah, like, yeah, like that. <laughs> So, <laughs> little bit um, action. I, yeah, yeah. Well, that 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 that's certainly part of our conversation, um, body action. Yeah. Uh, but I was asking you. Uh, it seemed that you've traveled and lived in different places in the world um, during your life. And um, when did you actually sort of land uh, in in Sweden? Uh, at what point in your? Uh, Two thousand nine. 2009, when um, I met you, in 2008, and by the time is, I was here, you is, is on, here. On, yes, my husband. Husband, and uh, he has blue background, and she has a kind of green background. <laughs> like that's that's the, the flag of your family, I guess, blue <laughs> and green. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we, we I was uh, in Singapore um, for. And I met you again in a performance uh, art tour in China. So 2009, I decided to move to Sweden to, and that's how I landed here in Sweden. Yes. Um, oh, Babette is here from Amsterdam. She's saying hello. Can you see Babette? And um, Joachim and uh, Jonas and Chuya are very much, um, pillars in the cultural community um, in Sweden and in China and in the international sort of um, space of uh, contemporary art and I dare say cultural activism. So it's, it's very exciting to have uh, close friends and colleagues here. Chuyia, um, I know that you began your work, uh, I think as training as a painter, is that, is that true? Yeah. Very, very early, like, you know, you started as a painter. It's almost like everyone started as a painter in the old time and you get yourself involved and explore and continuing. So I was started as like a painter, but I was, my interest was so huge, so wide. And I was like doing photography and ceramics and Chinese calligraphy and Chinese ink, you, you name it, like everything. Um, but primarily, um, I started doing performance. I don't put, really put myself like a performance artist when I start making performance art because I can't pinpointing whether it was, what was it? It's just like bodily involved of a, a project or even I was doing like in front of a video. Um, I, I was working on like mirrors and I built like a mirror sculpture and, and and interact with the mirror sculpture and, and film and trying to, you know, body, bodily uh, engage with the a sculpture. Or, uh, and there was, I would say like uh, early 2000 and uh, where I start encountering uh, with performance art. And of course at the time um, there were, uh, performance art festival was pretty much um, uh, energetic, I would say, uh, happening in Singapore back then in um, around 2000 uh, to 2010 before I left. Um, there were this festival, yearly festi international performance festival called um, Future of Imagination. So they bring in a, so many international performance artists, which also open up my encounter with action art. And yeah, yeah. more and more interested in that, yeah. Um, so did I understand correctly, you sort of have resistance to the idea of identifying as performance artist? Uh, I, well, it's a, it's a very tricky question, actually. Um, they, in a different context, they, I was kind of, I can't use the word labor, but I was called as like, 
performance artist, or even at some point when I was doing something concerning different practice or concern or thematic, is you always get a labor. Like for example, at some point in Singapore, uh, you kind of labor as women artists instead of artists. Or when you are doing a work that is more uh, women initiative kind of work, you will also labor as feminine, feminist artists. Or, and when you're focusing more in performance art, you sort of like also labor as performance art artists. But I would say that for performance, I, I don't mind to be called as performance artists because I have been involved much, much more in performance art in the past more than 10 years. So that I could say, yes, I, I could also call myself a like performance artist. But I I, I've done more than that, yeah. Many people might not understand why we spend time on this topic, but I think it's helpful to understand your concept of um, engagement with your body and connection with environment. So maybe you would say, I don't want to say it for you, but perhaps um, your body is one material in uh, a, a bigger uh, sort of palette, a bigger uh, scope of, of materials and energy and ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and so the idea of performance art is a little bit uh, limited or constricted. And you, you seem to occupy a much more expansive um, state of body and mind when you're performing. We see that. You're sometimes in nature. You're, um, you and Joaquim were ironing each other's bodies with hot irons in the snow. You know, you lie down on the street and you make your body available in a state of surrender on the street, uh, like Yoko Ono when she did the cutting piece, completely surrender, right? So a friend of ours, you know, Carolee Schneemann, um, she said she considered her body like a kind of painting brush or like an ex extension of the painting process. So that body became um, a, a, this kind of a tool uh, directly causing, um, you know, language and vocabulary with the body, sometimes with a naked body, and maybe with many naked bodies in some of her performances with groups, you know, group uh, interactivity. Um, so you're, you're, you're an event artist as well. Um, tell us a little bit about your events, but before you do that, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your sort of um, mentors or inspirations. And I don't want to uh, yet, um, I don't want to ignore um, the indigenous background of the Swedish uh, tradition and grassroots, the Sami and your own um, Asian background. And the, uh, you often invoke the warrior, the image of the warrior uh, or of, a, of um, a costume or armor representing a whole uh, energy field um, as example with your you know um, woven leaks you know you did this um, garment with with leaks so coming back again um, maybe you can just trace a little bit for us um, this idea of myths myth making uh, how did that process begin and, the, and where are you drawing the sources of your sorts of um, mythology, the uh, kind of um, cutting edge uh, innovation? You're like a myth innovator. Um, the, for for the, the whole series of, for example, League Warrior that you mentioned, uh, I, I would cut off the Sami part because I, I'm kind of like new arrival in Sweden. So the Sami part is not really in my knowledge or I, I do get, come across to or visit the land and been there and understand a little bit, but it's not really my field to talk about. Uh, but um, for the for uh, the League Warrior, uh, it started from a performance art action. Um, uh, have 
after been working on the um, many of different material and um, and for many years of doing performance art, I try to um, find a material to as you were mentioning about the vulnerability of body. So I do for the first moment when I was thinking and the, this piece was started like when we had this pilot uh, festival, performance art festival in uh, Venice, 2015. Uh, we had this Be pilot. Biennale? Yeah. Was, it, was it Biennale? Yeah, during, or the, during the Biennale, we have, we started 2011, Jonas and you walk in and I, we have been running this uh, pilot festival in Venice. Um, and we all going on the street and do live action. Um, it, the first edition was involving more than 50, 60 artists. So you see action all over the street, everywhere. Now, happening. while Kim has made a comment about pirate festival during the preview. So that was like a kind of, um, like in Edinburgh, you know, you have the, uh, the alternative kind of festival happening at the same time. Is that the idea, guys? Is that correct? Yeah. So um, did, you, and did you did you did you hijack the Venice Biennale? Is that the idea? <laughs> well, I don't think. Well, depending on how you look at it, um, if you're talking about exterior, yes. If you talk about interior, yes. Everyone is running around trying to get into different pavilions and get into like the, the, the press review and different events. So you see people busy running around, but then they cannot miss you outside. So the outside is become a performance platform itself and it's so happening and so vivid as I, my memory recall. Um, so that, that, and that's very been, energizing for you, invigorating. Yes. Yeah, it was. And then I tried to challenge myself to create new work all the time within the three days program um, every day together with um, all the artists. And the, the festival had been running for like five editions, about 10 years. And then we start looking at like um, finding its meaning of continue doing. Um, so last edition, we took a break to have an overview and really go around to see the Benale in a proper way and meeting people and having some communication. But this is a little bit sidetracked on the back context of how the League Warrior came, which is one of the editions uh, 2015. I started knitting the warrior. Uh, when you are among all the people who are running around, I was thinking of how to put myself, my body, in this uh, public space and, and to focus and put this, the body in the, um, how, how do you say it? Like expose your vulnerability by put in, in the public space uh, that I want to do something that is simple uh, with just one image, with simple and interesting material. So I, I testing on using leak and uh, something. I, I was at the meantime trying to explore about time, duration, material because mm, I've been participated in many performance art festival and realized many material that we're using is not really sustainable. So I was many years experience. I start looking at how I'm making performance by uh, choosing or by experimenting using more organic material. So I decided to use time, labor, uh, and try to knit, um, preparing a leek for, it is a very common food to find around in European country as, and in Sweden, and it's pretty cheap. So I find a meaning of, wow, it's a very well-known uh, vegetables and is uh, common and is uh, is no right. social leeks. The, the leeks leek yeah yeah 
It's a big deal. Leak, leak soup and leak in the, in the, in the, in the quiche and all these kinds of exactly. um, opportunities to, to yeah. connect with the leak. Exactly. So, it's health yeah. property yeah. and uh, is um, availability and is like, it's a, a veg it's a vegetable or a food that is uh, no boundary between classes as well. So when I'm looking at the meaning of this material, I thought, okay, I could use it as a, my, as explore this as a material. So when I was preparing um, the first piece, um, I, I started putting myself, maybe I could share a little. I could Time share. To, uh, is, to, yeah, are you preparing your PDF? I have a PDF, extra PDF here, which is not with you that I Great. could um, I could um, put in, uh, not this Is one, not this one. I have another one that I could actually share with you. Oh, another one. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so let me share. Um, Can you see? We had a little switching problem. Just try it again, please. Your screen yeah. share to you. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, I... Now I'm getting a bit clumsy because I, I was prepared for this and then uh, I wasn't so familiar with the, I wasn't so familiar with this um, Zoom as well. So let's see if I can still do that. Um, did you click share screen at the bottom? Yeah, I did. Yes. No. Okay. I. Anyway, I think. Um, I yeah. Probably I just leave it. <laughs> I was. Prepare this uh, uh, so, so that I can show the the image. Maybe it's in your preview application or something like that. Ah, now it's coming. Okay. Can you see this? Yes, perfect, perfect. We see um, we see several screens. Okay, so. I think you have Thank to, you yeah, there, that's brilliant. Yes. Okay. Thanks to you. Thank you for your patience and uh, <laughs> concentration. There's okay. a friend of ours, Su Su Suzanne is just coming into the picture here. Okay. There we are. Hey. Okay, so as you see, can see the this photo here. I was blindfolding myself. You hear me? I was blindfolding myself and um, having okay. and cover my mouth and my ears so that I don't see, I don't see, I don't hear, and I refuse to speak. And uh, I start knitting for three days in the public space around. And then you walk in, um, at the time we discussed about this image because uh, what came to my mind was just one image of a woman is knitting with a, a, a persistency. You are knitting together leaks yeah. and making it, making it into some kind of structure. We don't know what the structure is yet. When people yeah. encounter you, when they encounter you on the street in Venice, are they aware of what 
the sort of product will become? At that point, it was just a performance action. It wasn't intention to need a dress at all. It was just out, totally out of the idea of this whole League Warrior series. So it was started with just an, an act of with the resistance, with the body in the space, with one image, a woman image in the public space, knitting without able, able to see or hear or speak. So that was an image that I was trying to create a, a, a strong image um, because when when um, action took place, sometimes there are many sequences, there are many acts to put to compose together, convey a message. And uh, I was test, trying to experiment and trying to find a way that how can performance art can use just one image and um, and. And people, when they see the image and, and the passers-by who are so busy running around and see you, the image imprint in the head. So that is, we, I call did, it like a bodily memory. So Chuyia, did you move around to different locations in Venice, Italy? I want people to understand, people who are not familiar with the context, that the Venice Biennale is a huge festival that occurs every two years and that Chuyia <clears throat> and her husband, Joaquim and brother-in-law Jonas uh, created a kind of um, um, alternative event, a festival. And Chuyia, are you, are you moving around in Venice during, during this process? So people see you in different places like Chuyia yeah. is everywhere? Yeah. Yeah, like the first day I was by the uh, Asinella where the, the one of the locate outside Asinella um, near the ferry. And then I was also, um, next day I was moving to more in the smaller alley because the alley around in, uh, in Venice, they were so beautiful. And you see the local who live there with the daily, uh, life going on and that of, of course you can see the one of the photo in the corner here that they are laundry are hanging out on the alley and that is super interesting to see all this and um, so, we also have created a very holistic uh, moment like four five o'clock in the morning going went to uh, St. Marco Square because St. Marco Square is always flooded with tourists that is impossible to be there. So we, a group, whole group of artists, we walk there, some took ferry there and some walk there in the very early morning, like four or five o'clock. And then we do action together for each other to create that kind of connection. And with the serene, with the, it was so quiet and so beautiful that that memory was just just so serene and so real and then we make it like um uh, a ritual uh, or um, um uh -huh. every year we we do that you know when we come okay. whether or not we had the festival when we we had the chance to come to venice we do that morning ritual um Chuyia, I just want to point out that uh, I'm wearing a sweater that my mother knitted. And um, my mother is here. Uh, her name is Maria. Hi, mom. How are you doing? Okay. <laughs> She's muted. Well, nice to meet you, Maria. Mom, it's, it's difficult to mute you, mom. I don't know how that happened. You're muted, mom. Let me ask you to unmute. So... We can't I'm hear sorry, you I go. didn't. I didn't know I was muted. That's okay. Maybe. Now you're unmuted. Okay, I'm unmuted. So, so, mom, you know, I lived in Venice, Italy for many years, and I know it's a very um, pedestrian-oriented place. There are no cars, except yeah. on the Lido. On the Lido, mm -hmm. and the women are always. You see women washing their clothes and hanging the clothes outdoors between yeah. the houses and over the canals. And some people call that the international flags of Venice. Uh -huh. um, so Chuyia, um, 
and but mom, thanks for rescuing the sweater. Sorry about the moth. The moths got to eat the sweater a little while. It's kind of, you know, the forces of nature. So thanks for Mother Nature. You com you composed it again. Well, <laughs> that's the last time. I'm never going to do that again. I heard I heard that. It's a warning. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, I love, I'm so happy to introduce you to our friends, Mom, and. Uh, <laughs> Lucky for them if they get to meet you. And well, vice versa. what a nice thing! What a nice thing for you to say. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Thanks. Okay, uh, and Sally Harris is here, Emily's mom. So, Chuya, perhaps you can talk with us a little bit about um, the the women's sort of role, the women's body, and the women embodying um, energy, like a like a goddess or a myth. Uh, mythical warrior or mythical figure. What is the energy like for you when you go out into the public and you inhabit these roles uh, like ritual? You uh, occupy our attention, a kind of like a, a moving meditation. And then we are in that space with you. What is that experience like for you as performer? What is the tactile you seem like a very tactile person, a very hands-on person. What is that feeling like to interact with the immersive performance in public? Can you talk, and your husband is laughing his ass off, but <laughs> tell us a little bit about your experience, please. Well, I, I, I can't really put it in the perspective, like I, I did really, uh well uh how to put it um i probably are very sensitive and and avoiding to kind of using woman's body as um material when i come to uh i i mean it's like i cannot avoid that my body is a woman body when i come to an action what you appear as a body it is a woman. But my experience when I carry out a performance, I was more focusing on the present, the, the energy at the present. Um, and I am um, but I can't really, I, I haven't really or can't really pinpointing or I intentionally um creating myself as a goddess, it was started from unintentionally. And then when I see that it could be um, related, cu culture related influences or a belief or um, that I was later explore into and, and trying to create the warrior. So, um, yeah, uh, I ha haven't really like putting it into a uh, context, but uh, for, for me, a warrior um, is something that you're fighting with and we have been always fighting for different things in our life. Uh, so, and when it comes to food and environment, I grew up in the um, a, a village and um, planting rice and my grandparents catching fishes and, and I tend to have that kind of um, um, awareness of um, getting something from the land that how the land is feeding us and surviving so so in, interdependency yeah yeah sort of and, you rely uh, on land and and you also have to maintain the land you have to communicate with the land you have to dialogue yeah and and as a folk culture from a village in that sense you believing in goddess local goddess you believe in china in china uh, well, Asia? yeah, it, it can say that inherited from China because my grandparents are uh, migrated from China, um, South China, uh, basically. 
So I'm kind of like a third generation in Malaysia. But in fact, my father even also born in China and he moved to Malaysia after World War II, after the Japanese occupation. So, so we, the whole family uh, surviving by the sea, by the land, by uh, feeding the whole family for education and everything. So that give, uh, so the, the sort of like the, not fear, but the respect to the environment is so important that your father go to the sea and catch fishes. You never know if he come back safe. Your, your grandfather is also putting the effort to plant something on the land that you are helping in the land and um, planting rice. And if you don't eat them with respect, you know, all kind of, it's, it's like, I, I would say that it probably like a um, imprinted culture memory. Um, so, so ritual. As, Ritual in your art begins with the goddess in your childhood, huh? Yeah, I, 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 I didn't notice until in a later time when I read really looking back to the childhood where there are so many different ritual festival, like worship goddess, um, also a focused uh, events happening in the village that I never know that they have the meaning of the ritual is becoming so important. But then in the later part of my life, when I randomly going many things and come to create my own ritual, I found that ritual is really um, is a very important part where you keep life in the um, um, in order in the in the very um, real and uh, prepared and um, I just lost the word. Um, yeah. Yeah, but it's a, it's almost a, a wordless place too, a place without yeah. words, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You so, can say. do you do you think that the ritual, from your experience, um, is a kind of doorway or a threshold into the universe, a a meeting place with the creator? Yeah, is that like an idea? Kind yeah, of place, I would say yeah, place? it's a threshold where I start like open out and able to see things. But and but then when I was moved to Singapore, I don't see all this actually coming uh, because I was exploring to something else. I trying to um, to understanding the whole contemporary art scenes and, and trying to get into the 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 art world and understanding the practice. So it doesn't really come to me until when I moved to Sweden where um, cultivating, planting, everyone was very much into um, um, seeding, you know, because of the fall season, it's really nice to um, follow the season. Um, whenever, whether you have a small balcony or you have a piece of land outside the countryside or you have just a small piece of land, everyone is cultivating, uh, growing something big or small. And of course, living in that sort of environment is bring back my childhood skill because I was helping cleaning fishes, you know, do all the households. Uh, that's why when you were asking me the question of when I'm making my action in the public space, it's a long story back of the bodily, body memory where you have been so used to all these chores and households and making in, and they were very naturally come in place when I carry out an action or when I'm working on something. Yeah. Um, and the, she, uh, yeah. You, do you, you forgive me if, if I interrupt you uh, too frequently, but this is such a rich content conversation um, it's it's just a pity that we only have 60 minutes to chat before we have engagement with everybody. So I hope that other people will please um, be mindful of their own questions and responses and interact with Chu Yi. Uh, there are a few comments already um, ready for a post um, 9 p.m., 5 p.m. Uh, in interaction. Um, mm. Chu Yi, um, in this uh, moment of, of, of planting and the seasons changing, it's also a moment when the community somehow gets a signal 
we have to go out and act, yeah, to sustain our lives and so on. So the aspect of community seems also to be part of your um, work and also the uh, content of the important topics of, um, you know, issues that you've also woven into your performances. So you're acting like a conduit <laughs> with the universe for the audience or for the co-participants, yeah? And, and tell us a little bit about um, how community um, becomes a part of your work and maybe you can show us one or two more images. That would be very nice. Uh, you mean like in the, another PDF or the performance art piece or, or the PDF that, I, that we have? Whatever is at your fingertips, that's easy, yeah? Um, but again, while you're looking for some image, you could be thinking a little bit about, um, you know, this idea of community and, and integrating um, content, survival, um, all these issues that your work addresses, and, and the, also the awareness of being in the present moment. How amazing is that, that art makes us more present and can also have a contagious feeling uh, for the participants being in the present. Mm. Okay. I could show a little bit of my performance in the public space. In Joachim and I, we have been also doing some monthly performance on the street in, in Sweden, in Gothenburg. And um, yeah, no. Now I wasn't so, okay, maybe. So uh, greetings to Ron Smith joining us. And yeah. Ron, there's your old friend Babette in Amsterdam. And, um, and introducing you to Chuyia uh, in, in, in Sweden. What, what town are you in in Sweden now, Chuyia? It's, uh, it's 10 to 10. Uh, what, what village or what town are you in? Gothenburg. Gothenburg is also kind of cultural place, um, museums and place of uh, ac academy or Something like that too. Uh, yeah, it, it's kind of like a university city, and um, to be yeah, they there are some. Well, you, if you are comparing like Gothenburg to uh, to uh, Stockholm, uh, it's kind of different. Um, you would say that maybe there are more things happening in Stockholm, but Gothenburg as a home to many artists is actually in, not for the marketplace, but for uh, art making. I would say that many artists have been, um, us, there are artists who come and go and residing here or uh, moving to, to Gothenburg. And I also understand that, that, um, that there are pretty many uh, artists who are also um, um, they, they, they were like a art academy um, around uh, art collective and um, artists run space so yeah um, in terms of the community as comparing to as comparing to what I, I used to live in, it's, it's, it's still smaller, but the, it, there is a small community, but it's not really a... You, you need to put the effort to get into that um, community. Um, yeah. I, 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 do, I was more focusing very much in the performance art side where when I running or organizing with you working. I get to meet um, many artists and engage in local and in the beginning, people were really interested and, and um, yeah. 
Uh, I'm so sorry that I, I couldn't really pinpoint. Okay. Yeah, because uh, I wasn't so prepared for this uh, question, but I was more prepared for the, the question that involving my exhibition right now. So, so you, what, yeah. What, what, are you prepared for the exhibition uh, sharing? You can share this? Yeah, I was more prepared for the, the show that is going on right now. In, yeah, let's yeah. see that show, by all means. And um, I'd just like to introduce you to Nancy Azara. What, Emily? Should I share the PDF? Would you like Emily to share the PDF of the exhibition? Yes, please. Okay. And um, we have because one of our I, guests I felt, is here. I felt some... I felt some point that I, I wasn't a speak person for the art community in Gordonburg, even though I am also part of the community. But the community is pretty divided and and in a different way. So I wasn't I, I don't think that I would able to speak about that uh, so much. But of course, in general, we do have the art hall, we have the art museum and Gothenburg is the second city um, of, uh, of Sweden and in the West Coast and um, convenient of traveling down to Malmö and, and, um, and I also trying to uh, doing outside Gothenburg like Troy Hatton, another smaller city and hug there where I was uh, having my show there right now. Where yeah. Uh, more involving in um, or in the region, region, um, region. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, while Kim is saying yes, it's a a working class place, a hard working place. The Volvo industry is there, mm. and so um, maybe it's not so easy as a you know a contemporary artist to. Um, and also, did you feel kind of like foreigner? Or outsider. Yeah, I do feel like a foreigner or outsider when it comes to the comment about the vibes of the city because yeah, I came from not, Singapore with a very here, high here, metropolitan uh, art, art scenes and then you yeah, come to a, a place where it had its own history of the um, culture and um, like like when I have sometimes when I have topic and talk discuss with Joachim, he he lived here his whole life. His parents lived here his whole life. So he had a totally different input and, uh, and discussion about the whole art world in, in Sweden. But for me, I spent over 10 years time here in, in Sweden and, or in Gothenburg. For me, it's not deep enough for me to discuss or talk about that, the, the city. I want to introduce you for a moment um, to our friend Nancy Azara whose name here says Zoom user. It's very um, anonymous. But this, this anonymous user of Zoom uh, was the founder of a very important feminist institution in the 60s and 70s in New York City. And uh, a real activator and a shape shifter uh, and a, an organizer you know, of, of uh, the feminine feminist community, uh, which we talked about on the show last week. So I'm happy uh, that Nancy is here and now in actually amazing, properly properly uh, labeled. And Elka is also there. You see Elka and she and Nancy were uh, part of this original work, uh, social work also with Louise Bourgeois. Um, so it's a very interesting reunion and introduction to you. And you are not an outsider here. Maybe I should say, outsiders, welcome. <laughs> if you're not an outsider, we don't want you. <laughs> Insiders tend to have a sense of, um, you know, responsibility to be something, you know. So be irresponsible as an outsider. We need it. <laughs> so can um, maybe Emily would like to share. Uh, and I, I, I'm also quite aware, you know, that in the Italian culture and in, in Venice, there was the tradition of Commedia dell'arte. Commedia dell'arte in Venice, you know, and in, in, in the cities of Italy, there were people go on the street and do street theater that was very critical of social 
issues and hierarchy and the, you know, the royalty uh, and the social structures at the time. So you fit right into the Venice vernacular. And I wonder what that was like for you from that perspective. But here we are in the garden. Emily is now sharing the screen uh, as Chuya tells us a little bit more about this exhibition that's going on right now. And I guess we can see the exhibition virtually. Chuya, well, tell us about it. Yeah, you can actually, uh, the museum is creating a meta port uh, coming soon where you can actually go to the website and click on the link and you will be able to uh, visit the show um, virtually in a 3D form. So they are working on it right now. And um, the, the exhibition right now that is on show, but in the closed down mode. So we're trying to also do it as much as possible in digitally to introduce the show because the show was supposed to be going on for like more than five months, but after one month, it had been under closed down and it's still on, but under closed down. <laughs> So, yeah. And maybe, um, excuse me, maybe Joaquin, can you possibly share the link in the chat box to the exhibition, please, if you have a moment. Thank you. Uh, in the P end of the PDF, you will see the link of the of the 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 page of the in the museum page. But the the virtual page is not ready yet, but it will coming soon. Yeah. So the show is called Men and Land where when I was giving the opportunity to show this, um, to have this exhibition, I, I was trying to um, focusing on the, our relationship of human and the land, because for this, uh, for recent years, as you can see from my action and the traces of uh, the development of my work, uh, very much like in, in the nature space or outside, indoor space or in the environment. So, and of course with the, I just previously mentioned about a little bit about my childhood where I came from. So I, and of course in the very controversy world that we are living in today uh, about food, about um, environment. So I, tr I try tend to create a narration in this um, exhibition to talk about the complicated relationship with humans and land. So okay. here I kind of like a humanitizing <laughs> the land as a couple. So we are like a couples, we need each other's and we using and we, we rely on each other's very much. And we had to find a balance to be living in a more sustainable way. Um, so that was a whole concept in in this exhibition. And the exhibition so had the, four parts. The, 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 um, the, the calligraphy on the back wall, um, what does that mean? Those two characters? Yeah, the two character characters? is a very old uh, Chinese script. I using old Chinese script because no matter how it's still relating to uh, where I came from as like Chinese language is pretty much in the spoken language in the family. Um, so I, I was choo choosing uh, the most familiar language um, using the word, it means uh, cultivation or uh, plowing. Or if you add Plowing. another meaning, it could yeah. also mean agriculture. Hmm. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm starting for, with uh, the land and how humans interact with the land and how we started our civilization and the um, and develop, uh, so that by using the little symbol, as I have uh, described a little bit, if uh, Emery, can you maybe move a little bit lower uh, to the lower part, it actually does describe the hanging symbol, meaning in Chinese it's gokken, is plur or cultivate. So it's like a form, of two, a meaning of the tools. Well, the reason why I choose this word because of the, I, I, I think that is a human activity by having a tools and the land. So when humans start working in the land, it's form the whole relationship of how we using 
how we start cultivating, how we start making food to feed ourselves and, uh, and, and eat something. So when I, I remember when I was a little child or uh, a small uh, in Malaysia, I always say I'm very lucky to born in the on that land because I will never go poor because I can just plant and I can feed myself or I can just pluck something from the tree and I can just feed my stomach. And, and so it is, it's a very naive, a, a very, but it's also a very beautiful thinking of the availability of a, a fertile, of a land that providing. Uh, but of course, with um, of the today's modern context, um, human also, I mean, we also exploit the land by uh, over cultivate or uh, over farming or um, uh, over consume of something that is not necessary, but is uh, over consuming, over, over producing that uh, exploit the balance because the land and human body actually is both organic to me in this context uh, uh, that um, the land can heal itself by time. And same thing with body also need time and it heal itself or generating itself through a process. So in, in this, so for, as you see from this picture, uh, there's a, like a myth or a garden where audience can walk in into from here, you walk from here, one way in, one way out, and you come to the center here, able to see the hanging piece here, which is like two meter and three meter in size. And then you came come out here, so you are not bumped into another person if they are coming this way. So it's better that you come this way and get out. And from here, you go up to the second floor, which is a balcony or a mezzanine. So the, the this symbol here, the whole land is a uh, is a uh, borrow from the idea of the geoglyphs. The jo geoglyphs are um, from all over the place, and I trying to find the the form of it, and um, to talk about I, I come across to uh, um, I come across to um, a podcast talk about um, of this um, Joe Reagan speaking with the uh, Graham Han Hancock. They, they talk about the, the discovery of the under civilization in the Amazon ba basin. So when I come yeah. across to this topic, I, I was looking at the, the ci human civilization underground that discovered by the LIDAR. It's a kind of scanning laser uh, from the above the sky after the fire that all plant, all forests have been gone and then it's the land exposed and it was able to scan or some part expose uh, the geoglyphs. So I was using this context of to, to, to talk about human history and together with the land that how our relationship started. That is so long time before that we even mem remember or discover or realize of course, I, I try to have also have a time frame. So I set the time like between around looking at the time between like 3,000 to 3,500 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. looking at how this uh, civilization. Act. So I, I, I kind of creating the garden based on the idea of the geography where you can see uh, from the above and sure. together with the hanging piece and, and this grass are uh, actually the crop. Our stamper crop, which is what uh, kind? Of, what kind of grass? They are wheat grass. Wheat grass. So also smell. Yeah, the smell and uh, the green grass. You can actually cut them and subtract and bring the green juice. And um, of course, if they are cultivated in a farm, they will be. They can also grow to uh, to wheat, which is we are using to make flour and bread and pasta or noodles or whatever you need. And we know, we know that uh, these greens produce air, oxygen, to yeah. breathe, to eat with our lungs. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Did you know about my air projects with plants? No, 
I would oh like to. Yes. <laughs> well, would Babette, Babette came to see me when I was living in a glass house um, with 10,000 plants breathing once a minute in Holland. And um, I'll tell you more about that project later, okay? Mm -hmm. But so, so important that you uh, initiate people in the urban space, in the conventional, um, you know, dead space of a museum, the very life source, you know, and the uh, responsibility of interacting with nature. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's more like putting a seed to the visitor to start thinking of their own. I can't, yeah, self-initiative is uh, much more important than when you've been told what to do. So to plant the seed and of the awareness is much more important than telling, what people, uh, telling people what to do. Um, yeah, so, um, and here come to the lead warrior. Uh, when you come, go up by the second floor, uh, up to the mezzanite, where that is where the seven lead warriors standing. The seven lead warrior, they were using different skills. Some were like waving, some were like you were question, uh, putting the question about the tra tradition uh, handcraft of weaving, knitting, uh, cross-stitching, showing, and I was using different technique and cutting leek, dry them, and soften them by using the uh, gisseling so they are available and a little bit more sustainable so that I can wear them because for leek, once they dry out, they, they, are, they just break easily. So it's a very fragile material. So I, I was creating some of the, the pattern. They were very randomly made, but at the same time, they also follow a little bit of uh, little references where I was trying to look for like, for, for example, the terracotta warrior, um, or for example, uh, some of the, like for example, this weaving piece, um, like the bracelet where the red Indian are, uh, wearing them to protect the chest. Um, so they were uh, trying to use the different technique that, and, and put them together and see how they look alike. And when I putting on this leak shoot, they kind of transform me into a, a goddess or a, a warrior. It's like kind of um, in persona me to be a person which I imagine or uh, thinking I am that warrior that is protecting um, the land. So as you can see that I was using different um, continent and you can see the crayon and then the Arctic environment, the tropic environment, the sea, underwater. So uh, Emily can the rainforest so it's almost like across the seven, not totally, but uh, about around the different continent though and different living environment as come like forest, rainforest, sea, cor coral, and the uh, beaches and all the sources where you can think of um, that you can think of the clean resources came from. So these are some different view of how they look like in the exhibition space. Okay. Um, can I ask you a rather personal question, Chuyia? Um, and please, um, I don't mean to be impertinent or intrusive, but uh, do you have some kind of contemplation practice that you uh, reference during your every day or from time to time, your own personal rituals or meditation or exercise, yoga, whatever, kind of, um, you know, introspective um, kind of. Uh... Uh, no, not really. Um, it, well, um, 
when come to if you coming to the art practice, I I trying to looking at I doing a lot of household, and you can see that is my ritual, and um, but uh, when come to the art practice, um, I I do um oh, okay let's see um I. I, I, I can ask you the same question in a different direction, different angle. Yes. Um, when you talk about the ritual making art and it keeps you somehow in the present moment, how do you stay in the present moment when you're not making art? Hmm. Let me have to rethink. No time limit. Um, I think focus um, of the hand. Uh, for example, I often feel um, if I can write something, I need to be like, for example, on the move. But then when I am I think there is a goal, for example, um, if I have a yeah, um, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit <laughs> you know uh, too nervous and uh, yeah, no not well um, understanding or prepared for yes, but um, but your husband, I, I your, your, your husband is making a comment because he, he's with you every day, lucky, lucky people. And he said, um, first he said glycerine. I don't know why glycerine. And then he says, you cannot ask the tree how it is the tree. And then he says, almost everything Chu Yia does is or becomes ritual. Um, he's right in a way. That's why I couldn't put into word of to describe them into a description or a theory uh, because you're living inside the that practice. You're living like at some point trying to, to have the idea of like act, doing is act, the act of doing. Like every day's life when you are well, from the moment you get up and then you going through the day and then you repeating every day the same ritual, the same way of doing so that you are not forgetting something. And one day when I not following the same way of doing, I could forget things or drop off something or I want to do something, but it wasn't in the same way of doing it. So, you know, Tree, uh, the Tibetan people, you know, they became quite um, popular as a kind of um, culture and community to, uh, to learn from, you know, in the last, uh, well, 60 years or so in the Western world. But for them, they think of our mind as very funny because we Western people get very involved in the bubbles of our own life not necessarily, you know, understanding outside the, our own personal bubble. And um, there's a lot to say about that, but does it seem unusual to you that people actually meditate or do mindful study? Um, and when you, when you teach, I guess you teach, I see pictures of you teaching. What are you no, teaching I, people? I, 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 no, I didn't teach. I, I teach in the old long time ago. But uh, I haven't been teaching for a long time, but I, I do conduct like workshop. And um, when oh, I- the workshop, yes, workshop. Yeah, what, workshop. What is workshop? And then um, two year after workshop, uh, let, let us invite other people to talk with you because uh, I'm very selfish and I could talk with you for a long time. So what is workshop? Oh, why is workshop? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, it's kind of like a 
common name for, but uh, we trying to do things together and um, learn of a way of doing. Um, for example, if you are interested in a certain topic, for uh, like, so, for example, like performance and the participate participant probably are interested of how you are doing certain thing or achieve to a certain thing uh, of creating a work or as some activity. So you kind of leading them to achieve or, 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 or do something together in the workshop. So sometimes when I had uh, set up a goal of inside workshop, for example, a performance workshop, uh, focusing on how some aspect where you can practicing in the performance art, for example, senses that you need to, instead of aware of uh, people around you uh, to get nervous that lost your mind and you probably want to close your eye and just focusing your to the senses, like forcing yourself back to be more sensitive to the smelling, for example, the feeling of things moving around you or the touching, that kind of thing. So that's that is uh, some part of the workshop that I've been uh, conducting and um, or yeah. using material and things, exploring the materials. In that sense. So like also using the body senses to be in the here and now, yeah. in reality, in reality, yeah. sensitizing, sensitizing mm. ourselves. Yeah. Because the body is always in the here and now, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah. Body is in the here and now. Yeah. Let's turn over the um, the time now to, to other people in the community here. And uh, there are some links there, but we should uh, copy paste those links into the chat box for people. Um, but please, uh, thanks Emily for the hard work. And um, um, thanks everyone for being part of this community with Chuyia. We, we, we at the Institute, Emily and I would like to host one of your workshops one day. So just saying, hopefully we can discuss that, how, how mm -hmm. it can happen. So thanks everyone and, and please, um, oh, thank you Mete for pasting some of those links. Thank you so much. Um, so please, everyone, please in, in, enjoy this opportunity. Um, again, we're in a community space here in the restaurant in uh, Northern Manhattan. Um, and she, she is with us in her, in her garden, uh, virtual garden behind her. I think people are just blown away, frankly. Oh, Emily, uh, thank, thank, thank you, Emily. So please go ahead. Can you unmute? And, and I will unmute. Hi, Chuya. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Yes. Um, thank you for that. Your really spectacular work. I was wondering if you could um, share with us a story of someone who came into interaction with your work, like one of your performance pieces on the street. Did you hear from people what their experiences were? Mm, yeah, one of the, I can sh share one of the performance work that I call a very long performance work where I was using a row of red thread. I can this is a row of thread uh, that I actually found when I was on the performance art trip in Mexico, Noragachi, uh, Wachochi. And then I started a performance by using my hand, weaving small little flower. And when I come to Mexico, I don't speak the language, I don't speak, speak sp Spanish. And I came to a Naragochi um, village where the Raramuris are, and they don't speak Spanish. So how we got to be friendly and, and get interact with each other, I use action. So I make, make an encounter piece with the, the Indian um, in Mexico by 
using this row of uh, this row of red and start making flowers. And they were so shy when they were when people walk to them, they just back out and walk away. But for so I I was thinking about culture approach uh, of different different approach of the like, different culture, different tribe, or uh, different people. They had a different um, um, they, they are responding differently to different human being and stranger uh, where they're not familiar with. And surprisingly, when I was treading this little flower, they were interested and they were surrounding me in state. So once another foreigner came, or uh, a Spanish spoken person or someone from the city came over, they just moved away immediately. So that was a very beautiful thing for me to think that you don't speak the same language, but you can be just present and being quiet and being friendly to, sh to share the friendly gesture by making a flower and give it to them. So I just make them and then I just give it away, the flower as a gift or as a gesture of friendly gesture as a souvenir that our encounter our meeting. Um, so I had been touched for that encounter. So I started the journey of the thread of red, which you can also find in one of uh, maybe one page in my, my website, um, where I actually call it a thread of red be between us, where I've been traveling in to different places or whenever I had a chance to travel in different places, I try to do the same work and I receive different reaction. Uh, for example, when I do this piece of work in the very busy touristic city, people were afraid of me because they think I'm selling something that they can get conned by me. But then at some point when I was in South America, uh, doing this peace work, people were so passionate to share um, their story. In the beginning, I was just giving away as a flower or as a souvenir. Uh, later part, I come in, I encounter a suggestion of a references of the book, The Gift, to talk about the balance of human relationship of when you are offering as a gift, you kind of more superior than the receiver. So I try to change the meaning or change the approach instead of uh, giving away that little flower as a souvenir or the marking the meeting point between us. Uh, I I I asking for a story for exchange. So I slowly to collect story. So when I did the piece in uh, in Chile, um, uh, South America, Santiago, in Santiago, yeah in South uh, America. And um, people were just can't stop sharing uh, their story to me, even though I don't understand the language. I have, a, uh, I have a translator who is trying to translate to me, but it's not possible to translate everything. So I was just listening and they were all very open because they understand that I don't speak Spanish and I don't understand at all, but they don't mind. They were treating me as like, um, a listener. So, so it, it, it gave me, a, the, the whole idea of doing this is like an experimental process to try to understand that in the different context, when you do the same word, uh, you, you're receiving different reaction because of a different culture, uh, uh, um, different culture um, perspective and different culture practice uh, from, the whole world. Uh, it could be from city, could be from islands, could be from uh, deserted places, villages. So all mentality are different. Uh, so, so it became one of the work that I think is important. Maybe it's not so interested. So for some people, they think that, oh, Chuya is me treading the flower again and, and she's doing the same work. Uh, but for me, whenever I traveling um, at that time, I try to um, carry this role with me and the, the project is not finished. The reason why it's not finished because you do get encouraged 
is kind of putting yourself to speak to a stranger that people you don't know at all in art context and, and in non-art context. And I do get discouraged also by continuing these words. And then you take some time to do reasoning to yourself or to, to go thinking about or to cure or to heal yourself um, that how to continue this work again. So the, this idea of this project is to finish this role. So I need to make more flower with this role. And I need to travel more, but I haven't continued this since um, um, 2016, probably uh, 2017, 2016. I started 2010 and I haven't finished because at some point I was, I felt that I was uh, shattered apart or discouraged. Uh, I, I fighting with my own courage to how to continue the work uh, because it's, it's not easy to break the ice to stranger. And some at some point you're receiving different energy. Uh, um, I try to be a sensitive. Well, tell, 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 tell us about the man's story in Slovakia. Oh, you know about that one. No, I'm cheating because your husband is tipping me off here privately. I know probably you guys are in the same room, you know, like what the hell? Could you just yeah. get together and talk to each other? I mean, what's going on? Yeah, in Slovakia, when I was doing this work in the public space in the park in the city of uh, Kosice, Kosice. And um, I just randomly walked to people who I built eye contacts and I walk to them. And if they don't, don't reject me, then I can start talking to them. And some I start talking to them. And if they say no, then I just <laughs> look for another person. And at some point I come um, to this guy, he surrounded by three little kids around him. He looks very sad, but I didn't, I, I didn't expect anything. I just randomly walk to people and then I start talking to him asking for a story that I'm going to make him the flower. And then he said, yeah, I'm going to tell you a story that he had very sad story. At that point, after he told me the story that his wife left him with the three kids and his brother died and then he lost his job, is all negative thing happened to him at that point. And I suddenly... I was doing the, before him, I was um, talking, communicating, doing this performance with like maybe 10, 15 people. And then when I come to him that after he told me of his life story that happened right now to him, I've, I felt the dark energy <laughs> like shattered over me, cover all over all the sadness, like just, showering from my head to toe that I feel the chill that I felt with him and I feel so sad with him and I I don't know what to say to him to to but then I put my courage to to bless him to talk to to tell him and to create a, a hope by telling some like the encounter of this, maybe there is uh, nothing that is lower than this. Something may be great coming, especially this red flower because the red color is represent um, happiness and luck. And red color is also represent like um, passion and uh, encounter. Like when you tie one person to another person together that you build some kind of connection that his life at some point is changed. So, yeah. and then of Chui, course, Chui, uh, uh, also Martin Scorsese, you know, the filmmaker, mm -hmm. he said his favorite yeah, color. Sorry, is sorry, Marco? Martin Scorsese. He mm. said his favorite color is red because red is the color of blood. And blood is also what connects us all together. And your work with fabric is like the social fabric, you know, social mm -hmm. threads threading us together. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. When yeah, we were I, kids, we, I work we, we, very we, much with thread, like threading together because for, for I have a be belief or, or have a vision that um, 
uh, one line, when you're repeating that line, it became a past, it became one whole piece of something. It's depending on how you form that line. So when you have multiple lines going on and on, like where you, you can just use a pencil to just draw a line and this line repeating, it become a piece of mask. It's masking out. And the same thing with the, uh, just a, a thread. When you are threading into something, it, it eventually became, um, it became a, um, a piece of fabric. And that is, this is also, I believe this threading is also a contribution, maybe subconsciously to the leak warrior, where I started knitting with the leak instead of the thread. Yeah. Okay, next question. <laughs> well, like Babette has a question. Babette, yeah, of course. Yeah, thank you, Shukia. Um, um, I just wanted, I'm really um, thrilled by the idea of the League Warrior. And I would like to ask you, could you talk to the uh, mat materiality of, um, I mean, in how far has impermanence of the material anything to do for you by using specifically that material? Mm. But for the material itself, um, beside the, I'm putting it like a different aspect. One, uh, no, we talk about the concept of the material or we talk about the making sustainability of the material. Can I be? Uh, I would like to, you to address the fact that it's so, uh, that it represents impermanence in terms of leak will change its form and it transforms and the whole process behind it of the time you use it and the process that in, is involved. So I'm interested yeah, in that. A, aspect. The, uh, yeah, the, the dress is, is uh, time is one of the aspects that I'm emphasizing. And then the fajar material is the second part, uh, second uh, elements that I'm trying to put in under this piece. And, um, and in the beginning, when I started with this material, it was uh, it's so fragile. And I, I actually like the fragility because it's also a uh, suggest um, the fragility of life, of vulnerability of human body, human life, and, and, and with uh, all the danger or everything surrounding us. So that is how I looking and using this. Uh, and of course, culture perspectives as like, uh, is a, a culture, um, like in, in my own culture, um, we eat leek, but it's not really the same leek as like this one is more like the garlic leek that uh, is very important in family. Um, practice that we eat during Chinese New Year or even reunion or a specific phase of memorizing somebody and something like that because you're believing that you eating the, the word leek, garlic leek is a kind of uh, in Chinese it's called swan is that if you are eating for example now is Chinese New Year and yesterday was the 11 of the Chinese New Year that the Teochew people need to eat leek because when they eat leek, they have something to keep in the in the pocket. They they will have money for the rest of the year. So because just of like uh, vo vocabulary um, in, in terms of phonetically, it sound like something that you have something to come. So, but then in Europe, when I found this material, um, is a uh, is is kind of becoming something more like a all people food and uh, it looks similar, tastes similar to the garlic leek. And, uh, and you, so it's kind of like a cultural replacement of food when you are moving or relocating. You always explore like in terms of the food culture, you have to uh, 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 find an alternative or substitute to replace something that you cannot find. In, yeah, in something place. like also uh, potato is very, food of the very poor people also, yeah. as Wao King just mentioned. Mm. 
Yeah, I think Porredo have a very long different uh, story uh, from uh, different uh, culture and country as well. Uh, I met some artists who were focusing on Porredo. Um, but yeah, back to Lee. So during the process, when I found this material and explore, I cut them into slice and I tried to work on them. And when I cut them in very thin, they were just like thread. So I'm very good at using thread. I'm very careful with thread and very good in thread. So I was like, okay, this one line, if I connect them, you know, how they gonna be. So I was working on without thinking about how they're gonna be. So I start using it to knit. And, uh, but after a while they dry out. Uh, when I was doing it in uh, Venice, the humidity in Venice actually make them really smell very badly and strong. And uh, they even molded under that high humidity in Venice. And, but then when I was bringing back to Sweden, our uh, well, humidity here is probably like between like 70 to 80 um, or 65 to 85, something like that. So it's, it's a very nice condition actually. We, we, when I prepared more of the lake and they dry out beautifully, like the olive green when they dry. So I love the nature, the color itself. It gives such a beauty um, to the piece. Uh, so when I start knitting with the cut that piece, I, I thinking of uh, of course I have a lot of talk and discussion with the Joaquin, my husband, and and I come across the idea of knitting a cherry a dress. Um, it will be how it looked like and how much time it will take. So finally, I proposed this to Singapore Benale and Singapore Benale loved the idea. So I was needed 180 hours for five weeks inside a glass room every day, six to seven hours, just sitting there knitting a whole kimono light dress that I eventually put on life um, on me. And, um, and, and that piece wasn't, I, it was all, a, all of this project like a process that I have not thought about the conservation of the material. Mm -hmm. I, was, I just know that they, they're going to hang like this and dry as it is. And if they need to keep them, they need to spray a little bit mist of water to soften them a little bit. They can't just fold them as they, when they dry, they will just shatter apart and, and broken. And so I have to give instruction that, oh, you have to spray them and when you fold them, but then you can't just keep them be, uh, in uh, rolling them in, in a confined space because they will rot. They will molt and roll. So, uh, but eventually um, they find a way to cons uh, conserve the piece in a special condition. After I came back, I continue experimenting and I was doing some research of how to preserve dry flowers. So I come across uh, using uh, gisling, um testing and I was so happy it worked. So I have some old pieces that is already dry. I soaking it into that material and I let them dry and they're soft and they can work mm -hmm. again. I was so happy that, oh yeah. You know, we, when during Singapore Benale, I need to like two weeks to prepare just enough time to dry the leak. Uh, for me to able to work on them every day for five weeks. So I have to get some assistant to really help me cutting the leg every week. Imagine every week, 20 kilo of leg cutting. Uh, uh, and how about dry your, them. Your, your fingers? And how about your fingers? Any reactivity? The, the finger is fine, actually. Uh, one thing I didn't realize is that when you have so much leg clock together in a confined space at some point, your eyesight going blur, then I realized it was the gas, of course, and the smell filled out the whole room that at some time you had tear that you don't have no, because they were so subtle that you had no idea that uh, that smell actually uh, came 
or the guests came from the league. But it was such a nice experience anyway, because every time you walk into that space, you entering another space. So, but of course, body remembers the smell and a posture. So to knitting, sitting for six, seven hours per day for five weeks, no matter, I, every time when I left the space, um, I try to do different activity, yoga, stretching, uh, so that I can re relax the body. The next day I go back to the same space again, I probably will be able to holding and that position and continue. But every time when I go back to that same room, sitting on the chair, it's like the, the body is just create its own memory. All of the thing that you're doing outside the room doesn't work. You start feeling sore, pain, sour, muscle aching, you're, you have sitting problem, any physical consequences, you have it. That That's is br so brilliant. That's such a gift. That is the, the experience from the body. And in terms of the mind, when you're locking inside the room for six, seven hours, you're not communicating with people. They're only looking you inside from the outside the room. You see people, you look at them, they give them a smile and then you continue to knitting. What's going on in the mind? So the whole process of focusing in one action, it became so meditative. And I, in, when you were asking if I'm doing like meditation or doing any practice of something, I do not do it in a daily basis, but in that long duration performance, I encounter meditative stage where I reach some amazing, beautiful stage where you see like white light shower on you. And then you are kind of entering some different space. It's such a different experience that I never able to, when I try to reach that again by myself, randomly, it doesn't happen. So I try to figure out like, how does it happen? And in what, con what context and what condition it happened? And sometimes you really had to, if you really want to continue encounter that moment, you have to continue the focus. When you get distraction or someone say, hey, hello, or waving at you and you look out, you probably just lost that moment. So I had a great experience in terms of my mind. And I had so much of a whole, almost like a whole life reflection <laughs> in that room as well. Yeah, this is our 20th show, our 20th show. We began our first show talking about darkness with the poet Anne Waldman and her friends, including Babette. We talked about darkness. When you're having this experience, do you experience negative emotions? And can this negative emotion bring you to the light? No, it wasn't negative to me. Uh, oh, okay, sorry, I, I understood sometimes sadness comes, sadness, mm -hmm. yeah? But then light comes also. So mm -hmm. I'm... I'm just referring a little bit to this idea of sadness. Yeah, when when come to like a meditation um, process, I, I try not to, um, for example, if I'm mourning I, or sad, I won't do meditative, but meditation. I often have the very um, kind of step back, um, a uh, uh, very try to be careful with uh, sp sp uh, spiritual experience. So I always believing when if you are very negative, bringing together with some negativity with you carry on, you probably are in inviting yourself into a more uh, negative uh, situation. So yeah. It's just a personal pre preference. Right. And I, I would love to probably just do meditation under when 
no circumstances, like not a condition where uh, con conditionless, like by accident or when I prepared that, oh, I had nothing, just I want to enter the emptiness. I'm not super happy or not super sad. I want to encounter something or want to try something or do something, yeah. So well, Kim wanted to say something earlier, but maybe he would like to comment now. And yeah, I'm well, happy. I think that yeah. uh, we can go a little bit longer, but I just want to be respectful of what uh, people are expecting um, in their own, you know, individual time schedule uh, in Minnesota, in Boston, in Amsterdam, <laughs> in Sweden. So uh, thank you, and Upper Michigan. Okay. Uh, no, but I think it, what I really liked with Shuya's performance in Singapore Biennale was that she was making, after every day of work these five weeks, she made uh, a five minute recording. Everything that come up in mind. Can you hear me or am I? Yeah. Oh, no, I can hear you. Oh. So, uh, she made recordings that are she put together five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, and it was you know all the emotions that comes up after her work, sitting there knitting for five long weeks. Maybe you can tell them about that too, because that was also with sorrow. You were crying, you mm -hmm. were high, you were laughing, and and, and the, with your tears. Yeah, for that piece is very specific for me also that I am. Um trying to looking from a pers performance perspective where we often looking at uh, action as a body form. We are looking our visual focusing of an object or a human on and the, something that this person is doing, but you never know what is happening in the mind. So I trying to record because our mind is going very fast. And so every day, I try to whatever I can recall or I can remember in the last 15 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, I try to give a narration of what's going on um, of the whole six hours every day, nonstop. And eventually edited into like, a, uh, I think four hours recording. So recording in, into de device, into a device, you recording? Yeah. Yeah, so I had a mic with me, and in the last 20 minutes uh, before I leave that room, I will continue knitting, but I will talk. I will kind of get myself, prepare myself of, okay, what happened from I came in until I finish. So at, at what, what was in my mind, what, Julia, my emotion. At what point did you decide it's important to record these experiences in the process? Uh, um, for I can't really because, like I said, that our mind moving very fast. We forget things very fast, also. So I cannot just tell everything for the whole six hours. So I can only highlighting of something that can that I remember that came I, I mean, in my head. After three days, after two days, you started to record. No, no, no. Every day from the day one. From day one. Yeah, so it's a 30 days performance. And these recordings, are these like raw material for other work? They, or they what are you were doing? Ed edited a little bit every day because I need to have the, the recording have to be on show after I left the room when the exhibition continue. So they were documented the whole process of video of me inside the progress of the knitting, uh, the knitting progress and my narration for like four hours after edited. But I didn't edit too much. It's more about sometimes when you are thinking and you have that moment of, uh, um, you know, so just cut it off. Otherwise, most of the, the, the speech, uh, the narration are inside the recording. And then they were all on the show together. Uh, so when audience came into that space after the performance session, they are able to walk into that space to see the real piece and they're able to smell the leak. 
they're able to go closer look to the material itself. They're able to sit on the floor to see the video of me being inside. And that glass room actually is on the street. So every day it passes by, pass by. And I was stepping outside the room and watching myself and to remembering and oh, I don't call it mourning, but it's more like a ritual of memory of you being inside the space for 30 days. And every day, six, seven hours. And then now you left that space and that place is empty without you and, and what left behind. And then you hear passers by who pass who work around the area passing by every day. They will tell each other story. Oh, there were a woman knitting there every day. And now she's gone. So it's, it's a very beautiful thing to remind you about the present that people remember when they are passing by that space every day. At some point, like some... Um, mother and children pass by because they probably have some learning center nearby and they have to go by maybe two times, three times a week. And then they were so sad, like, oh, I'm not there anymore. Every day they were so happy running. The first thing in the first, first thing when they pass by, they come in front of the glass panel and looking at me and see what my progress and and happily talking to each other. Of course, I don't really hear what they're talking, but you see the action, of course, and you feel so encouraged by that. Yeah. And so that was a piece uh, started with this knitting the future where I continuing uh, doing, um, and later on I contributed and come to uh, the, the League Warrior. So the seven League Warrior wasn't included uh, this, League War, uh, the knitting piece in 2016 in Singapore Benale wasn't included in the Seven League Warrior because it was uh, become a collection to the museum uh, right now. So, but then I can trying to make other pieces to create that after a while I said, oh, now I had made, I fulfilled my dream to make one dress. And now I want to create an army so then I start thinking about, oh, I want to create more pieces, maybe 10, maybe 12. So I try my best that I can to create more. And now I have that seven pieces. Wow. Yeah. From um, yeah. Well, there's, there's Mete and it looks as though Mete is also in Sweden. And I don't know if other people have comment uh, to make or question, but Mete, how do you know Chia and what is your... Um... I'm actually working at the art museum, Kunstmuseet in Skövde, where, where Chuya is exhibiting now. So it's been a pleasure to, to listen to you all, Emily, John, Chuya. And um, it's also been a pleasure working with Chuya and the labyrinth that you see behind her to see her planting the first seed, to see the wheatgrass grow, and now how it, after almost five months, turning yellow. And it's been amazing to to see the whole process and to follow her work. So and yeah. also, I would like to add something when she talked about the warriors. If you see the little stair behind her, that's the stair to the balcony in the art hall. And um, from there, you can see um, her seven leak warriors are standing and kind of uh, guarding the labyrinth and the garden. Yeah. So it's, um, you can't really experience it here, but you will see it later when we have the 3D. Uh, video ready for you. So, um, some Kunstmusik or somebody on Instagram reposted um, our posts for today. And was that coming from your institution, or do we know who this is? Yeah, okay. yeah, it was me. Oh, you. Well, then, yeah. hey, I. I <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I, okay, keep up the social media. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mette, for your great work with Chugi and, and for sharing your experience. Just yeah, it's been a why, pleasure. Yeah, sorry. Hold on. Babette also? No, yeah. I just want to wind up a little bit back to Babette's Babette, uh, question about this, the material itself. I haven't really finished because it's a little bit sidetracked. But yes, when after I found uh, Gisling to work with, the piece actually are, uh, um, I can wear it multiple times. I can carefully lifting up and take it, putting down and wear them and nicely fold them and trying to keep them when I have to move them somewhere, I have to also 
keep them in the um, very carefully, not in a confined space, more, more like a breathable, breathable space. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, Baben is an extraordinary uh, filmmaker, artist, social sculptor. In fact, she created a television channel in Holland for the themes of Buddhism, films about this theme and, and culture. So I just want to introduce my sister of many years, Babette. Can I, um, John, uh, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, fine, yes. Uh, um, I don't know if you and Suya would allow me to hijack this meeting uh, by bringing up the great um, uh, poet Lawrence Ferlinghetti who just passed away last night. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, at the age of 101 years old, uh, you know, he used to be a landlord of mine in San Francisco, and oh. he's an amazing person and who was responsible for most of you knowing to put Howl, you know, the ma most amazing poem out in the world. Howl by and Allen I, Ginsberg, yes? Okay. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he, of course, started City Lights. But if you don't mind, I would like to read a poem by him to honor him. He is such an amazing uh, force for poetry, you know, in the United States. Is that okay, Suya? Do you uh, allow me to read a poem yeah, yeah, by yeah. Lawrence Folengetti? Yeah, I think you would like it. It's about women. Uh, it's called To the Oracle at Delphi. Great Oracle, why are you staring at me? Do I baffle you? Do I make you despair? I, Americus, the American, wrought from the dark in my mother long time ago, from the dark of ancient Europe. Why are you staring at me now in the dusk of our civilization? Why are you staring at me as if I were America itself, the new empire, faster than any in ancient days with its electronic highways, carrying its corporate monoculture around the world, and English, the Latin of our days. Great oracle, sleeping through the centuries, awaken now at last, and tell us how to save us from ourselves, and how to survive our own rulers. Who would make a plutocracy of our democracy in the great divide between the rich and the poor, to whom Walt Waltman heard America singing. O long sibyl, sibyl, you of the winged dreams, speak out from your temple of light, as the serious constellations with Greek names still stare down on us, as a lighthouse moves its megaphone over the sea. Speak out and shine upon us, the sea light of Greece, the diamond light of Greece, far-seeing Sybil, forever hidden, come out of your cave at last and speak to us in the poet's voice, the voice of the fourth person singular, the voice of the inscrutable future, the voice of the people mixed with the wild soft laughter and give us new dreams to dream, give us new myths to live by. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, for really enriching so many poets' lives. You know, for recognizing Jack Kerouac, for bringing out the beat poets in San Francisco. And thank you, Suya, for sharing your art with us tonight. Thank you, John and Emily, for making this possible. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so great that these meetings are not just giving us the knowledge of each other's art. We are, John and Emily, you are providing us with a network, you know, to connect to other artists uh, living, you know, in different spaces and which we need so desperately right now in this cultural lockdown. lockdown. Thank you so much. Thank you. Babette and everyone. Um, thank you, Babette, for showing us again how to love the world and that as we all do love this world 
in, in all that we're doing um, and doing it together makes it happen a little bit faster than if we do it alone. So um, very grateful. And I, Emily and I would also like to um, offer the dedication of this show tonight, not only to the memory and spirit, the energy of Fairlong Getty, but also to our friend, Monet Clark, who lies in a hospital now suffering from um, an immune disease caused by environmental uh, conditions and factors. So Monet, we're with you. We love you very much. We rely on you to recover and to love the world together with us again soon. And um, we're thrilled to be co-hosting or co-curating um, an actual virtual exhibition in a few weeks with you. Come back strong. Yeah, uh, right on. What? Oh, Ron has a question. Ron, um, come on in, Ron. Ron Smith, or Ron, who is it? Here, me. Oh, it's, it's, it's Ron Daniels. Ron How's Daniels in, in, um, in, 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 yeah, good. Better you Berlin. I mean, you Berlin. You Berlin. Julia, I love your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I was very struck by your, uh, uh, when you were sitting in the plaza with the uh, X on your mouth and over your eyes. Immediately made me think that, you know, we, uh, the marginalized people of the world, you know, we are here, yet they don't allow us to speak. They don't want to see us, you know, yet we are here. And I love your presentation that you put yourself out there with the X across your mouth and the X over your eyes. Because we are here and they cannot deny us. And by the X that shows that we are sovereign individuals, you know, that, that we understand our personal sovereignty in this world that we're all in. Yes, we are here. Thank you very much for that. It was a beautiful, uh, it really you. moved me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What were your thoughts when you did that? Can you please? Um, I think many of my performance pieces like a diary to me. And most of the action I, I did during or at time uh, often some, something that I felt of that period of time. So I did feel like powerless um, that um, you don't have a spoken word and, and it feels so uh, minor, so small that um, that a very strong feeling of um, could be like from self-censored yourself because you don't have word, you can you don't have voices or or you you there's um the that what is happening around uh, us or me around that time uh, at some point um, when you when you're not a politician or when you are a person, a, a normal citizen, uh, there were, there, whatever you say is not important. Um, and the important were always by the more powerful people that people are listening to. Mm -hmm. So at some point, you know that something is wrong with, um, with the whole hierarchy, the whole system, and uh, at that point, I felt like um, action speak louder than word. So I was using the symbol to um, using, actually, if you see, I cover my ear, my eyes, and my mouth. It's also like the tree monkey covering ear and eyes and mouth. So that I can choose. It, it, it's, it looked like a protest, but it's also, I try not to making it like an activist uh, action because I still want it to be a, a, a art word, a art piece of work. So I try to look at from a more um, visual, artistic uh, and aesthetic perspective 
we're not using those symbol. So, and, and using the sign of the tree monkey, no ev evil, no see, no hear, no speak, because we are living in a very polarized world, not right now, or even five years ago or 10 years ago, or even maybe further, when you come across to a different stage of life, you understood that, oh, something you may not understood until you reach a certain point of understanding and you, you can know that you, you can see a lot of uh, unfair thing happening, especially people who have no power. Yeah, so yeah, that was uh, the reason why I was uh, covering my ear, eyes and mouth. Covering the eyes could be like, okay, see no evil. Either you don't want to be affected or you are censored yourself or you are putting yourself in a disguise um, perspective that you don't want to see so they don't exist or you don't hear. It could mean also in a positive or, or negative or more. So I, I, I try and I often like to look at things from the passive and the um, the positive and the negative, the passive and the active. Yeah. So to hear, to not hear, yeah, it, it, it could be a chosen to not hear, but it's, it could be also a chosen to hear, but not hear. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chief, Chief Seattle uh, told the Catholic priest when they made it out there, he, he asked him, he goes, if you would have never told me about this place called heaven, would it exist for me? And the Catholic priest had to admit to him that had I not told you about heaven, no, heaven would never be, nor hell would, would exist for you. It's only because I told you. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, it's interesting it, the perspective when, you know, we let things in that are important to us and we put up shields to stop what harms us you know yeah. same yeah. with the visual and we always uh are taught that we have two eyes to see things twice two ears to hear things twice and one mouth to speak with mm -hmm. so it's always wise to see things and hear things twice before we say the first words that come from our mouth because they're usually wrong you know and we sometimes regret but then that's the greatest teacher is, is humility right yeah it yeah. is it yeah. is yeah and I'll, I believe the walking found is familiar that I often say this word, that something we don't know doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, so this is also, is, it could be the other way that something is existing, but we don't know. And another thing is don't believe everything you think. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. I don't know if... Um, I bet if you're in the mood tonight to um, sing us Good Night Ladies, it was so beautiful when you did a few weeks ago. Really very beautiful. <laughs> so uh, if you've got it in you, um, sing it out for, for Phil Longetti and for all of us. No, I have my share today. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Um, should we say good night, Anne? Thank you, Chewia. It was very Thank interesting. You. Thank you. Thank you Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for your patience. I know I was dropping a little bit and I was nervous, but when it come to talk about my own art, I am I'm really happy to share. Yeah. For my the bottom of my heart. Yeah. We're we're glad that you came to to dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for showing up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Good night, everyone. Bye -bye. Be safe. Be safe. Bye bye. Bye. Lots of love. Bye bye. The Tuning Fork, setting the tone for cultural activism through weekly encounters with cultural activists worldwide, live on ICAI, Institute for Cultural Activism International.